Welcome. I'm Steve Gross, Associate Professor of History and the Campus Archivist. And it is my pleasure to moderate this discussion this morning um, with um, five members of the Morris community. Um, Keith Davison, Jim Togis, Jim Olson, um, Mary Clauda, um, um, the way that we will proceed is I will ask a, a few a few questions, um, and uh, the panelists will will contribute by telling what I think are going to be some really fun and interesting stories. If you have any questions uh, for the panelists, please feel free to uh, post those on the using the Q and A icon at the bottom of your screen. So I think we'll get going and I'll just ask people to do themselves um, in any order in which they, uh, um, which they might want to. So, so Mary, why don't you go okay. So I, my name is Mary Clauda and I graduated from UMM in 1977. Um, I was a history major, French major, um, and I actually went on to work in history for most of my career as a an archivist and um, later part of my career I got into IT and I'm now retired hoping to travel once that's possible. I'm Jim Olson I'm one of the original 13 faculty members um, retired in 2001 and still alive and well living on the shores of Otter Tail Lake in west central Minnesota. Uh, Keith, would you like? Yeah, I'm Keith Davison. I'm I'm not a, a graduate of UMM because when I graduated, it was not even a, a gleam in anybody's eye, you know. But I uh, I practiced law for many years, and uh, then I was a judge, and uh, I've been retired for goodness, uh, well over 20 years. <laughs> they retired judges at 70 and uh, in Minnesota, and I'm 97, so I've been around a while. Uh, and uh, my connection with UMM, uh, I was on the original Wasilla group, uh, although I didn't live in Morris at that point, but uh, uh, that group was really responsible for the location finally being in Morris. Uh, I recall when we were having, we got down to to uh, either uh, Morris or uh, several other places in there. And we had, uh, well, we brought the legislature out, a special training, you've all heard that story. And uh, eventually we got it. And uh, since that time, uh, I moved to Morris, uh, in about 1990, uh, and because uh, my chambers were here, here when I was a judge uh, for many years, and uh, and I, I met Dave Johnson, uh, who was well, he was a third chancellor, I think. Yeah, I think so. Anyhow, uh, I, I met him uh, for lunch. I'd never met him before, and uh, it, it was. Uh, well, my wife and I went down to some point in Morris to have lunch with him, and he had Vivian Haltimus with him. It was the most expensive lunch I ever had, and I didn't pay the bill, but it cost me thousand dollars. The first time I met Dave Johnson, he put the B on me for money, <laughs> and he got thousands. <laughs> but anyhow, so, yeah, let's let's come let's come back to to that in a bit. So, Jim, do you want to in introduce yourself? Sure. Jim Togis taught chemistry here from 1961 to 2013, retired in semi-retirement. I'm teaching one honors course per semester, so I'm still active. Okay. So I'm, I'm interested in how people first became associated with, with, with Morris. And, and so Jim Olson, perhaps you could start since you have the, the longest history here. Yes, I, I came to Morris in 1959 as an instructor in the West Central School of Agriculture. 
why they were looking for a person to teach chemistry in the ag school, and preferably with a master's degree in chemistry, was a mystery at the time. Uh, shortly after school had started, uh, and Rod Briggs and I started at approximately the same time. Uh, shortly after school started, Rod caught me on the campus one afternoon and said, listen to the Cedric Adams news tonight on the radio. And there's an announcement. And the announcement was that the regents had decided that they were going to start this program at Morris. And the next time I saw him, he said, well, you're going to have to be a part of this. And so the, the rest of that year, I did teach in the ag school. And I was involved in looking around for places that we could have chemistry labs and other kinds of lab, but chemistry primarily. And uh, working, being around Rod was, was very invigorating. It was, uh, uh, it was hard to keep up with him, but uh, it, it was, he was probably the most uh, interesting and exciting person I've ever worked for in, in terms of getting things started. He was worried about a lot of details. Uh, we had homecoming in the fall of 1960 with a bunch of freshmen that had been on campus for all of six or eight weeks, I suppose. Um, but that was just the, Rod's way of starting a college campus. So did you transition immediately from, so you were originally teaching high school courses? I, I just did that one year and the following year the college started and I was told essentially that I was not going to have time to do, to do both college and stay in, in, the, in the ag school curriculum. And uh, that was eminently good <laughs> advice because I was very busy uh, being the chemistry department that first year. So, and, and Jim told us you were hired a, a year later? Yes, that's correct. Uh, I was finishing a master's degree on the Twin Cities campus in organic chemistry. The college wanted an organic chemist. I heard about this position from a prof on the Twin Cities campus and the first person who got in touch with me was Jim Olson. And so we've had a long history together. And I, I won't dwell on this, but uh, to come out for my interview, I rode a train. They had a train with a dining car on it. I tell my students that we stopped in Benson and the buffalo hunter got off and shot a buffalo and we roasted beef or bison on a spit too. And that was our, uh, our dining car. But I came on a train, which is a pretty unique experience these days. So Keith, could you speak a little bit about how you became associated with West Cedar? With, for, for some of the use, for, for those of you listening in, as the West Central Educational Development Association. Um, and so, Keith, how did you become involved with that group? Well, I knew Ed Morrison, and, uh, and uh, he called. And uh, uh, I, I live 30, 35 miles away this year. And, uh, but I'd known him since we were kids in school. Uh, I, I lived in Morris for two years when I was in the, the seventh and eighth grades. And so I knew Ed and uh, uh, anyhow, he called and, and uh, talked to me about what we were doing to try and get UMM here. And, uh, and I went around and uh, uh, talked to some of the wealthier people, have some put in money, things like that. And, uh, uh, but I was not living here so that I didn't, uh, uh, I wasn't as active as, well, like Ed and, and uh, Clayton Gay and Dr. Bambler. These are all politicians at that time when the legislature used to have a, a lot of doctors and lawyers. and. Uh, Cliff Benson was a lawyer from Ortonville, and he was a state senator. And that's why I, I was just kind of on the edge. I think I'm the only survivor now. Uh, but uh, uh, and then after after we got here, when I lived here, then I became more active. I, and uh, I remember President Club and long time things like that. 
and uh, watched UM, UM develop. My oldest son went here and got his uh, baccalaureate degree at UNM and uh, then went on and got his MBA down in Twin Cities. And so he has always been uh, interested in UNM, and, uh, uh, but he's now retirement age. Uh, he uh, <clears throat> comes back to Morris most weekends. He lives, he works in uh, in Omaha. He's a railroad. Uh, well, he handles the money <laughs> and finance. But he learned his his uh, basic baccalaureate degree in UMM, and uh, so I've been in connection with that all the time. And, and I, I play in the Jazz Fest when we have it. I play in the, in the, with the West Central All-Stars. So and, uh, and all of the chancellors have been friends of mine. Uh, that is, starting with Dave Johnson. Uh, we came to Morris about the same time. Mm. And uh, our wives were both Minneapolis girls. And so they, they, uh, we're very close, and <clears throat> now we're both widowers. Yeah. But Dave is still alive. He's uh, has some physical problems, and but I've been, been involved in UMM for many years now. Thanks, Keith. So, Mary, could you speak a little bit about how you were? You went to high school in Rochester, right? Mm -hmm. So, how how you ended up at UMM? Well, I think, I, I really don't know. I, I mean, I know my, my older sister came to UMM and I remember visiting her when I was still in high school and I liked her friends. Um, I remember that was, it was a lot of fun. And we must have had a guidance counselor at Lourdes. I went to Lourdes High School. I, we must have had a guidance counselor that knew something about Morris that pushed us to go. I, I mean, that's the only thing I can think of because it was so far, I mean, relatively so far from Rochester and um, there was, I too took the train fairly often to get back to Morris. I would, I would have to get a ride to the cities and then we'd get on the train and it always, I think it would drop you off in Morris around 1130 at night. So um, but yeah, that's, I think it was mainly because of my sister hmm. and that, and um, I, you know, didn't get home much. So because it was so far. So I think partly that's why I came to came to love it came to love it so much because I was always here or there. In Morris. So. so what were your first impressions, Mary? Oh, it was just so small and remote. And it was very, I just remember how flip and cold it was. Um, you know, back in the 70s, there were, I think, I mean, they always, you know, everybody always says, oh, it was colder when I was growing up, but it was really cold, cold those winters. And I remember the snow would be dirty because it would, the, the, it would blow over from South Dakota and it would just be that South Dakota dirt in the snow. And there would be tunnels, you would walk through campus up there between, I don't know, between Bemler and, um, what is that called? Student, student Union, what it, by the library. And there would be tunnels. I mean, the snow was so high. I mean, there were six foot walls of snow as you walked across campus. Mm -hmm. um, it was, yeah, it was bleak. <laughs> That's a good, bleak is a good word. So. And, and your first impressions of Morris itself, of the, of the town? Um, I found the town very, very welcoming, very friendly. Um, you know, when I, we would, we would do on the weekends, we'd, I think food service was closed on the weekends, So we'd always have to go and find food somewhere. So we'd go downtown, we'd go to um, Papa John's and get sandwiches. Um, we'd get Don, we'd go to Don's and get caramel rolls. Um, I don't know if Don's is still there. I think Don's is still there. Yeah, some things um, don't change. Yeah, and you know, I, I did, I did, a, I did some, part of my history major, I had to do some um, primary research and so I was at I went remember going to Stevens County Courthouse and you know using primary sources there um, so I mean I, I did I like the town 
I, I mean, it was, it was easy to get around. We, I never had a car, so we walked everywhere, or ride, rode our bikes. Um, I remember shopping downtown, going along the main street and shopping, and I kind of liked it because there was no choice. I mean, you know, you really didn't have to decide whether you wanted to go to Dayton's or Donaldson's. You just went to Bonjo's and, you know, got whatever you needed in terms, you know, if you wanted to go shopping. Um, yeah, it was, it was it, very good, good memories of those, those days. So, so Jim Olson, what were your first impressions? The, my first impressions of Morris were, uh, it was kind of like, uh, small towns in Minnesota that, that I was familiar with. And I found it, it very welcoming. Uh, the teaching in the ag school was, was rather a busy job. We were, my wife and I were also in charge of a, one of the residence halls. Now it's, it's called Pine Hall. And so I, I had this responsibility of keeping track of a bunch of high school, sophomore and junior boys, which was was an interesting experience all by itself um and so we really didn't get downtown very much but it was it was one of those things that uh everybody knew kind of everyone else and for example when the time came to we decided that we had to build a house because we couldn't find anything that was suitable uh to live in uh the, the mortgage application was i think about a 20 minute conversation with one of the bankers and the paperwork was all done. So it, it really uh, was a very welcoming community. They were very conscious of the fact that this university that had been started out there needed to succeed. And by one of the things that was, that was necessary was to make sure that everyone felt welcome. And it, the town had everything that we needed and wanted. So it was, it was a great place for uh, to start a family and to uh, and have very very successful and, and satisfying work. So, and Jim told us your your early impressions. Uh, my when I started, there were four of us who started at the same time, four bachelors, who were constant companions with one another for two years. We ate all our meals at Shorty's Cafe, which is where the arcade is now. Uh, Shorty and Mamie Waller were wonderfully good to us. It's like family. And all of the staff was interesting. They were real characters, but uh, that was home. And, uh, and so felt extremely welcome. Uh, you know, I had found a new home uh, and had left it old. So mm -hmm. it's good. It, you know, it was, it was stark. And I remember you know, we walk so much, and I certainly empathize with what Mary said about how cold it was. And we legged it from campus downtown, back and forth, uh, but we survived. <laughs> Keith, you were, you were mentioning earlier that with the founding of, of the college, the, the legislature chartered a, a train or at least some cars on a train and came out to to look over the grounds could you talk a little bit about that well yeah that was uh, I, uh, I was I was still living in Wheaton when that happened and it was the Wasita group that, that uh, chartered a train uh, Senator Benson was really active he was dealing with the Minnesota Association of Railroads they had at that time and uh, uh, so they actually chartered the whole train and brought the legislature out here and uh, wind them and dined them and, and convinced them that it was a, an appropriate place because, of course, we had some of the buildings and so on that were, uh, had been used or were actually were still being used, but, uh, but the, the uh, student body was getting smaller. Uh, and I'm sure Jim also would remember that, but why they, they apparently it was already decided that they were going to close that by by whoever made that decision. And, it, and the question that was uh, before us was to convince them that Morris was the place to come. And uh, uh, they did almost, I mean, it was constant lobbying, you know, that sort of thing. And uh, 
which is kind of fun, you know, to do. And, but it was a long time ago. <laughs> Things were, uh, Morris was so different than we had, uh, uh, when I was a kid, we had two hotels, the Merchant's Hotel and one across the tracks, of, what was it called, uh, Pacific or something like that. And, uh, and we had uh, a lot of grocery stores, no super, no super values of any kind, but uh, uh, it was a different era. And uh, uh, you could do things that you probably can't do now to get things done. You know, politics is a lot different now from what it was many years ago, and uh, especially uh, the legislature, because the legislature now uh, it's almost a full-time job. In those days, uh, uh, a lawyer could figure out he'd go every other year for a, a few weeks down in St. Paul, and that was it. You know, you, you could still have a law practice. You could have a Dr. Bemro as a medical doctor, and uh, uh, well. It was, uh, Thomas Taylor was here at, uh, he was practicing law and uh, uh, almost everybody that was anybody in Morris was involved in working one way or another to try and get UMM here. And uh, and they were, were successful as you all well know. <laughs> we have problems now that uh, we have to consider what we're going to do with the future for UMM because it's always been a, a different from any place else in the, in the university system. And it's a, you know, like, like, I don't know who started calling it the jewel, but they, it was really the jewel of the system in so many ways. Uh, and we, we've had, uh, <clears throat> always something exceptional going on here. And, uh, and now is our problem is to, we want to keep it exceptional. And uh, uh, so I don't want to go on too long here. So anyhow, that's uh, uh, the way it was uh, back 60 years ago. And, uh, and it's still, you know, it's still the only place where a kid can come and bring his horse. And, uh, <laughs> Uh, and we've had, uh, uh, we've got a good jazz program that, and uh, that used to bring a lot of kids from the Twin Cities. Uh, I know I, I would get to visit with them because I'd, I'd play in the jazz fest and uh, uh, I know one kid came out from uh, one of the suburbs and the reason he came out here is to play in a jazz band. He became a yeah, he went from Morris to medical school and he became a doctor, but he came to Morris simply to, to play in the jazz band because it was better. Our jazz band, band was better than the one at, on the Minneapolis campus. And that caused some problems because uh, with the UMM dance band used to always play for the Christmas party for the President's Club, which was the President's Club was always held in, uh, well, uh, on a campus where the old uh, football field used to be. And uh, you know, and anyhow, the UMM dance band would go down and play for that. And uh, one year they didn't go and the, the Twin City campus sent their big jazz band down and they got all kinds of complaints from these donors, big donors, because they wanted to have that Morris jazz band back because it was so much better. And that didn't make it good for us with, with the, for people on a Twin City campus that didn't like that. <laughs> <laughs> That's because these are, these are all big donors, you know, she's president's club, I don't know, you have to pay a lot of thousand bucks. That's a, that's a good story. Um, J Jim Olson, you were, you were talking the other day about, about beer runs and at, during the early days with, uh, with other faculty members. Could you, could you, could you retell that story well, my recollections are, uh, first of all, the, the faculty in the first several years were mostly uh, people that had just gotten out of graduate school. 
And so they were live, used to living on beer budgets. And one of the first things that got checked out, of course, was, well, what, what is the beer supply in Morris? And there were several, uh, the liquor stores were all municipal. And there was the, the usual grumbling that graduate students can come up with about the prices and the quantity and, and the choices for beer. And so finally they got together and, and I think it was on either Thursday night or Friday sometime, one, one or two people would go and buy beer by the case at whatever was the, the liquor store that they could find that was the cheapest. And this was not just one or two cases of beer, but this is like 10 or 12 or 14 cases of beer. Then they would come back and they would divvy it up and everybody would pay cash, of course. And one of my recollections, I was not a regular member of that. But I, I didn't consume beer at quite that level in those days. The, but the Jack Imholt lived not too far from us. And one time he came back in a little... I think it was a Dodge Dart or something like that, that they had taken the back seat out of in order to get more of those big fiber cases of, of beer in bottles. And I don't know how many cases were in there, but it was as full as it could get. And as soon as he arrived in town, everybody descended on the place and they, they took their share and paid their cash and, and away they went. This went on for quite a number of years. If you get some of the uh, older faculty members together now and talk about it, everybody has a different version of how long it lasted, where they went, and how much they had to pay. But the general agreement is that, yes, we did indeed have a beer run, and it lasted quite a while. So, Mary Clauda, I had a, a, a special request to ask oh. you about a monkey call. Oh gosh. <laughs> the stairwell of the library? Could you? Yeah, I think I know who that person is. Um, yeah, it was, I'm not sure what started the monkey call. Um, it, it actually started in the dorm. We, I, I really don't know why we started doing animal calls, but we did. And um, my friend Christy Hegdahl and I, she kind of, we both took to this monkey call and I mean, we were, we were good students, but we had this silly side and still do. Um, so we, pra we, we, I remember we would first do it in the showers because we, we could hang on the shower curtain and do them. And we kind of pretended like we were a monkey. And then um, I think Christy just egged me on and she made me do it in the stairwell of the, <laughs> of the library. So. so yeah, it was us doing the monkey call and then, along with the streakers. We had... Um, it was the years of, we had streakers in the library. I, I don't know if people know, nowadays know what a streaker is, but they would run buck naked through the library and into the, <laughs> and um, yeah. We had a, do you want me to continue, Steve, about my, <laughs> my extracurricular activities? No, I'm gonna, I'm gonna ask, I'll ask some okay. more questions later okay. about, about okay. student life and socializing. And, okay. And All that, right. That sort of thing. All right, the, the, the news about the monkey calls, you know, what, what happens on the Zoom stays on the Zoom. Okay. <laughs> so, Jim told you, you, you had suggested that you might have a story about the Cuban Missile Crisis, of all things, and, and how that played out on campus. So, could you share that? Sure. It seems improbable. But 1962, and you probably all know this, the Russians and the Cubans had agreed to place Russian ballistic missiles in Cuba. And this had been discovered by the U.S. Air Force. And President Kennedy said this was unacceptable. So there was a crisis that developed. It turns out at the same time, Senator Humphrey came to campus. This would have been in October of 1962. I'm not sure what his purpose was. He was in uh, Edson Auditorium. But at at the time of his arrival, the crisis took a critical turn because there were Russian cargo ships sailing west across the Atlantic, and the government suspected that these had missiles in them. So the government, the U.S. government, picked a longitude, said that if the Russian ships crossed that longitude, 
that they would be stopped by U.S. naval vessels, searched, and if they had missiles, they'd be turned around. Well, that's an act of war. And Russia and the U.S. were the nuclear powers. So watching these ships sail towards the crucial longitude seemed to be like the moving of the hands on the doomsday clock. Now, were we going to have a nuclear war? I don't know what Senator Humphrey had intended to talk about, but what he did instead was to talk about the crisis that was on. He talked at considerable length. He excused himself and said he'd be back. He called Washington and got the latest update and then came back and talked to us again. And I think that happened a couple of times. So we were quite, you know, it's like we were the press being updated on the latest news about this developing crisis and the movement towards a possible war, which happily did not happen. Fascinating story. But you, you had suggested too that there was a, another story about international affairs in which um, you had done a road trip after your first quarter of teaching and somehow this involved the Secret Service. Could you could you fill us in on that? Yeah, it's a, it's a goofy story and it's, it's got some dark sides to it, and uh, but some crazy sides too. I mentioned that I had these, there were four of us who were constant companions. We came to the end of our first quarter of teaching and wanted to celebrate. Uh, we were together, there was a fifth guy who was not so close to the group, I'll call him Bill, not his real name, he'll come into the story later. But we decided what we wanted to do was to see a movie, go out and eat somewhere. So we went to downtown Morris and looked at the play bill at the Morris Theater, White Christmas. No, we didn't want to see White Christmas. Let's go to Glenwood. And after 60 years, I still remember the names of the, the titles of these films. At Glenwood, it was a double feature, Pirates of Tortuga and Chartreuse Caboose. No, we didn't want to see that. Let's go to Alexandria. So we went to Alexandria, where the movie that was playing was The Wistful Widow of Wagon Gap, starring Marjorie Maine. No, we didn't want to see that. We didn't want to see a movie anyway. Let's go eat. <clears throat> so we went to the VFW and ordered food. And I said, uh, oh, I'd like scotch and soda. And the waitress said, are you a member? No. Well, I can't serve you. So I had to get by on food. We went back to Morris. I was sick of the affair by this time. Uh, the rest of the crowd, I went home. The rest of the crowd went down to the VFW. One of our group who was not native born, was Asian actually, got very unhappy. Uh, he felt that he was, had experienced a lot of racial prejudice. He said, felt very alienated. And that did nothing for the mood of the group. And so the whole evening was a complete bust. Now, fast forward to winter quarter. Rod Briggs gets a call from the Secret Service in Washington. <laughs> Somebody had been calling the White House with a message for John Kennedy from the Pope. And the Secret Service had finally traced that call to the Morris campus. Well, here's the dark side of the story is our friend Bill, who had suffered a severe mental breakdown mm -hmm. and left campus following that. Now, the upside of the story is that many years later, I saw Rod Briggs, and he brought the subject up about Bill and said, uh, well, the good side of that story is I hear from Bill every year at Christmas time, he's doing fine. Uh, I think he's living with his parents, and whether he ever got back into academia, I don't know. But that was our abortive attempt at a celebration after our first quarter of teaching. <laughs> Interesting story. It's a yeah. crazy time. So Mary, Mary getting, back, getting back to you, um, could you talk a little bit more about, about student life in the 1970s? Well, you know, there wasn't, there wasn't a whole lot to do in Morris, and I'm sure there's more to do now. Um, there was one theater. 
um, we actually back in the seventies, I think we, there was this window of time where when I, when I went to Morris, we were all, we could all drink. The drinking age was 18. So we spent a lot of time, um, at the tip, at Dale's, at the tip top tap. Um, at, if you really wanted to go high end, you'd go to the back door and that was kind of a fancy place. That's where the hotel, the, what is it? There's a hotel out there on, on the, um, on the highways, something else now. Um, we made our own fun. I mean, this, I remember we played broom ball outside of, I lived in Independence for two years and there was like a, like a big dip in the, out there and we, there was, they would ice that thing up and we'd play broom ball. Um, it was pretty, pretty uh, serious stuff. I mean, people got hurt. Um, and then I remember in the spring, this Christy Hegdahl and I, she, we, we worked up something where we took a bike and we had a skateboard and we somehow rigged, we rigged up some, took some rope and we made it, we, so Christy would ride the bike and I would be on the skateboard and she would be pulling me. And it was like I was water skiing, except I was on a skateboard. Um, we did that, you know, how the, we, the sidewalks at Morris, they're also, you know, you can just kind of go and go around all the buildings. We did, we did that. Um, we, we, I would ride my bike out to Palm de Terre. Um, we, there was always something. We'd always do something. There was, it was never boring. Well, we could study. I mean, there was that. Um, yeah, we did, we did, we did, we, we made our own fun. And, and I think, again, that's, I made good friendships because of that, because we, we didn't, we weren't on our phones. We weren't looking at a screen. We had to, had to figure out what to do with, with ourselves. So Mary, what were, what were academics like? Uh, I really liked school. I mean, I liked, I liked studying. I liked, I mean, I liked learning. I, I was, I, I, I never really wanted to be a history major, but I think I was, I just hit a good, I had a great, my first history class was great. I enjoyed, I enjoyed was with Joe Tripp, I believe, or maybe it was Berta Hearn. And I remember I was, I had to write a, a book review and I got a really good grade on that. I mean, I was, and I was encouraged by my TA. The TA was Peg Peterson, Peg Michaels Peterson. Um, and I just, you know, I, I really, really liked it. And I was always, somebody would always take me under their wing academically. And um, it was, yeah, it was, I never knew what, how good of a school it was. You know, I guess, I, guess it, I mean, I, I didn't know that until later that we got a really top-notch education at Morris, but it, it, to me, it was just, it, just what it was. Um, yeah. It was, Thanks. Yeah. So the two, the two gyms, I've always been curious about what faculty thought and experienced during those early days and to what extent you were aware that, you know, that you were really building something and that this was, you know, a, a unique place, a different place, an exceptional place. Um, the whole notion of doing liberal arts out on the prairie. Um, and so could you speak a little bit to that? Jim, you want to go? Oh, okay. I'll, hearing silence. Um, yeah. <laughs> one, there are a couple of factors that, that enter in. Uh, UMM started in 1960. Uh, I, I was in chemistry and we were trying to develop chemistry and physics and, and mathematics. This was also the time of the uh, post Sputnik era and the US was gearing up with tremendous amounts of money through the National Science Foundation to try and keep up with the, the pace with the Soviet Union. And so the result was that science faculty with graduate degrees were extremely scarce. And they were reluctant to come to Morris because we didn't really have any majors in, in the early uh, 60s. And so there was always this struggle of, are we gonna have enough faculty members to teach the courses that are necessary in order to survive? And I use the term survival uh, literally because the threat was always if we don't have the right numbers of students uh, 
the, the survival of the campus is in question and, and that would always have been accomplished simply by cutting budgets. So there was always the terror of, are we going to have enough students and are the students going to be successful? And so the faculty that I was primarily associated with in those days were all scrambling, trying to keep the, the ball rolling. Um, it was always interesting at faculty meetings though, where, and one of the thoughts that I have about those faculty meetings was it seemed like everybody smoked and the room was so full of blue smoke by the end of a faculty meeting that you could barely see. Um, but there's one thing we could always agree on and that is that we were going to be a liberal arts college. There was never any doubt about that. There was always friction around the edges of how do we do that and what does it mean? But that was the one thing that Rod Briggs installed, instilled in everybody was the fact that um, that was what our goal was. Jim, you take it from there. Yeah, well, I think that's a good point though, that uh, uh, we would see other campuses in Minnesota wavering on what they thought they should be doing and sort of shifting with the educational winds. But uh, at Morris, that was never the issue. It's always very clear that what we were was a liberal arts campus. And it's what I wanted. Uh, I was first generation college. I had been to St. Olaf. I valued my education there a great deal. I valued it for its breadth and depth and hoped that that is what we would be doing here. Now, I think in my organic chemistry class, I really didn't realize how hard I was driving those students because uh, the class originally met five days a week for lecture. And by the end of the year, I was teaching things that I'd studied in graduate school. And uh, students, you know, hung with me as best they could, and they were very good students. And so I was impressed. There's a lot of informality. Uh, well, I shouldn't say that. I think it might have been in those days that uh, uh, I was on a Mr. or Miss terms with the students, no first names. So there was a lot of formality associated with that. But I think we always had that sense of, uh, of setting a high standard because we were, after all, part of the University of Minnesota, and that was what was expected of us. And I, too, remember those faculty and committee meetings where everybody smoked and you came out stinking of tobacco. And it's amazing that uh, more people didn't develop lung problems because of that. Uh, the campus also gave me an opportunity to explore areas outside my specialty of organic chemistry and then physical chemistry. Uh, and uh, I took advantage of that. The campus has been very indulgent, but, but that happened very early. Uh, I remember, and I'll just mention this, that uh, two other faculty and I improvised a course called The Literature of the Occult. And it was a crazy course, uh, but we had great fun at it. and uh, And that was another aspect of it. Why should learning not be fun? Uh, it should be, even if it's rather demanding. And I'll close by saying simply that uh, I remember it was hard work on my end. Uh, you know, you were always preparing for class. And, and uh, whenever you have a new course, it's always a lot of work. But I was a rookie and, and trying to find my way in that. It was hard work, but it was good work. So let, me, let me redirect to, to both of the chemists here. So how would you have described the students back in, back in those days, in the 60s and 70s? They, well, they were very, very dedicated. Um, they, I, I didn't have much to compare with, first of all. I, I had been a graduate student, so I had worked with undergrads in that capacity. And the, the students that, that we saw at, at Morris were, they were coming for the right reason. And the, they, they worked hard. Uh, one of the stories was that, well, there wasn't very much to do in Morris. And, and our response would be, well, you don't really have to worry about that. We will keep you busy enough that, that the, the lack of uh, multiple uh, events downtown is never gonna be a problem for you. Um, 
And then when students would, would leave and then come back and visit, we would find out that, oh, well, they felt like they had been very well prepared. Uh, one, one of our success stories was a, a fellow that taught most of the physics in those early years, Richard Berkey. Uh, he kept track of the students that would transfer from Morris to the university, the, the IT, which then meant the Institute of Technology. And that meant they were going into an engineering program. And it was quite a number of years of students transferring down there when they would get to the Minneapolis campus and their grade point average would go up. Now this was highly unusual by, and it was noticed by the faculty members in IT on the Minneapolis campus that those, these Morris kids come here and their, their grade points go up. Usually they go down and, and a lot of them flunk out. And that turned out to be a real plus for us in the sense that we gained the confidence of those people down there, which told us that, well, we had good, uh, <coughs> excuse me, good students that knew what to do with the book. Uh, they used to work all the problems at the end of the chapter and not just the odd problems. So it was, was one of the statements. So we had very good students and they, they proved themselves very well. So, so you know, I would, so that um, uh, the question arises often the difference between students nowadays and in the past in the early years of the college and I've certainly reflected on that and I, I would say there's one difference now I think students are more socially polished than they were uh, when I first started but the quality has been there all the time and I think that that has not changed. Uh, one finds students that are relatively weak in mathematics, maybe. Boy, you find some real whizzes, and that was the time. So we've always had good students here, and, and they have done successful things with their lives. So uh, the notion that uh, there's been a kind of sea change in the nature of the student, I'm not sure. Uh, I, 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 I doubt it. I, I think they're pretty much the same. I'll add this. Well, no, we're talking about the students in the past, and I'll let it go with that. So let me turn the tables. And Mary, what did, what did you think of, of the faculty? Oh, I was afraid of some of them. Uh, but I guess I, I took French, and um, there were, you know, I was, they were, they were, they made us work hard, but, um, you know, they, uh, some of them were just very, very welcoming and willing to help and willing to promote. Um, yeah, I never took any chemistry, you guys, so I can't, can't, can't really spin off any of that, but in the history department, um, I had, you know, good relationships with every one of them. I was a teaching assistant for um, for Berta Hearn and um, Ted Underwood, and I think I even did something with um, geography. Who taught ge who taught geography again? Um, I can't remember his name now. Um, yeah, I mean, it was kind of like Jim Olson. I really didn't know what to compare it with. So, I mean, that was they, I couldn't say they were good or bad. It was just they were, they met my needs. So Keith, earlier you had used the term, the jewel of the system or something along those lines. And you were talking about how exceptional Morris is. So could you talk a little bit about more about that and how and why um, University of Minnesota Morris is, is unique, exceptional, Special. Well, it always has been. Uh, you know, it's a, a, a good liberal arts college right in the middle of cow country. And, uh, uh, and uh, we uh, sometimes take advantage of that, but I think, if we, I think we can do more with that. Uh, we have some exceptional things in this little town, uh, you know, the the industries that we have, uh, 
it really is cow country now. It's a uh, uh, these huge dairies all over, mm -hmm. and uh, and then we have the uh, well the bean bean operation. Uh, uh, you're all familiar with bush beans, and uh, but most of you don't realize that 60 percent of the of the bush beans that are sold in the United States come from Morris, and uh, uh, we have the same thing with uh, Superior. You know they. Have, they're in all these different businesses throughout the world. They have now have expanded into Brazil and uh, they run all that out of Morris. And, uh, and we're, uh, <clears throat> I, I talked to one of the uh, owners of one of these businesses last week and he said, we would, we would like to have more management people coming out of UMM and, uh, I checked and we do have a, a management course, but I don't, and uh, we've had it for years. But uh, he didn't realize that, that that was there. And and uh, I don't think that, that we've ever contacted him to find out what he really wants. And, uh, uh, but uh, I, what he told me is that he'd like to have some of these rural students that uh, they come to the school and they go get their education and go elsewhere, and uh, that he would like to have us tailor some of our things so that they would stay here and we'd have people with uh, uh, liberal arts education running some of our businesses around here. And uh, uh, I think that's possible. Now I know that the uh, the chancellor has met with the. Uh, the head of the soils lab, the federal, and also with the uh, with Lee Johnston from uh, from what we used to call the experiment station, mm -hmm. the ROC, and uh, and uh, I know that uh, the, the chancellor feels that that we could do something where we have that unique, you know, you can't raise cows in, in, on the St. Paul campus. And uh, you can't have a wheat field down there, but we can have it out here. And uh, so that the, the two uh, university entities, you know, UMM and, and the, what are they called? Food and fiber, I think, instead of the ag department down there. Mm -hmm. yep. <laughs> Isn't that what they do? And I think that that is uh, something that, that uh, we, uh, as residents of Morris and uh, and you, uh, uh, well, like the two gyms, uh, uh, you've been around here long enough so that you know all about that sort of thing. Uh, I know uh, uh, we've got, uh, well, Jim Olson, your wife still works here, doesn't she? <laughs> She's she's still working remotely. Yes, that's true. Yes, she does. She she takes care of the uh, the uh, monitor under my bed. <laughs> you know, where they know what's going on with me down at the at the doctor's office. But anyhow, uh, uh, there are a lot of graduates of, of University of Minnesota that have really been exceptional in their fields, and they're all over. You know, if you go down to the Chanhassen, the star of the, the show, could very likely come from UMM because she she plays both in uh, in Chanhassen and in, in at the uh, Guthrie, uh, and uh, and of course the Chief Justice, graduate of UMM, mm -hmm. and uh, uh, these things are you know you get a good education. There's no question about that. I don't think anybody questions that at all, but I think it's unique in that uh, uh, I know that I have friends in the Twin Cities whose grandchildren came out here and once they got in it they, they stayed they, they liked it you know they can run back and forth to Minneapolis and they still stayed out here uh, and uh, because of, of how, how it works at UMM it's a it's a small you know friendly place in uh, the, the campus is that same way. It's, the town is that way. We've got our idiots, of course. Let <laughs> but me... We also have a lot of other people. And I think that 
that the, the future of, of UMM is is how we work together and maintain this originality or whatever you want to call it that we've always had out here. Let me ask that same question to to Mary and to and to the two gyms. So, what is it about UMM that's that's unique? Well, I I kind of kind of we're listening to Keith, and it's like it's it's kind of magic. It's it's just a special place, and you come out there, and it's like it's kind of, it's bleak, and you say what what am I doing here? And then you just kind of I, this is my experience. You, you, you meet people and the faculty and the, even the ladies that would clean our, the dorm and they were all just kind of like our parents, I guess. So they, we, I just felt so, so taken care of, you know, being away from home. But then as a student there, I felt very respected and heck, I mean, I didn't, again, I didn't know, but I got, all kinds of opportunities that I was able to be a teaching assistant. I was, um, I was on the radio. I was on the radio. You, know, well, you couldn't do that in the Twin Cities. You know, you, I was, I was able, to, able to be on the radio station. There was one, I don't know how I got involved in this, but we were out. <clears throat> I got involved with um, Roger Strand's political campaign. He was running, I think he was running for the state legislature. And I remember somebody had a car. We were, we were, um, canvassing all around the counties there. Um, you know, all things that were kind of, they were extracurricular, I mean, kind of outside of the, the coursework. But honestly, that's really, I think, what has helped with, you know, with my success in my career. Um, but again, it's just kind of funny because I didn't, it just, it's what it was. It was Morrison. It was, it was, Fun, but I guess I I've, I've never called it magic, but I think it is a magic place in that way. That's nice. So. Thanks. So I'll add, one thing. I'll add one thing to that and briefly, but it's something that I've always said to students who come here and are considering coming to Morris, and that is the way that our students work together. Uh, Pre-med students are likely to regard another pre-med student as an enemy. That's never been the case here. Our pre-med students work together. They, they're cooperative. They learn together. And I've always seen that kind of congeniality between the students as a real positive aspect of what we do here. And Jim Olson, could you? Well, the only thing that I would add in terms of uniqueness is the, the fact that uh, the one thing that we had from the early days and continues today is the fact that we are part of the University of Minnesota and the standards are set very high by our colleagues in the Twin Cities and that I, th I believe in virtually every case we have measured up. We have been able to produce the kinds of students that, that match not only very, very well exceed uh, what typically comes from the, the Twin Cities. So the uniqueness of our connection with the U of M is, is a significant one. And Steve, can I just want to add one more thing about liberal arts too. And, and you know, liberal arts is, some, sometimes people think it's too, there's what, you know, what do you do with liberal, liberal arts? But I look at my career and others that I know and, I mean, I, I did work in history, but I also got involved with information technology and computing, which, which was something that I, I never took a computer class in my life. Well, I did, I did take Fortran briefly at Morris, but, um, you know, it's, it's, it's that kind of, as a, liberal arts makes you think, it makes you look at things in different ways, it makes you be a problem solver. You know, there's never any answers in life, and so you have to know how to work around that to find the answers. And I think that's really what liberal arts did for me and Morris specifically. Perfect. Thanks. Well, I think we are out of time. So I would like to thank all the participants and everybody that was um, attending our Zoom webinar um, remotely. And thank you very much for a wonderful, wonderful discussion. Thanks. Bye. Thank you. Thank you all.
Thank you. Thank you.